So um, we went over two parts of the course. In part one, we discussed what is quantum field theory and why. We talked about going from particles to fields. Um, and we gave an example of quantum sound phonons. There were, those were the two first lectures. Then we switched gears and talked about classical field theory. Um, and in classical field theory, in part two, we went over the action principle. We uh, clarified some aspects of what we call in physics locality. And we gave a few examples of classical field theories uh, that in the last lecture. So there will be problem set number two that will be posted on Thursday. So now today we're gonna to start part three of um, this course, which is going to be about conserved charges or principle of symmetry. But let me just start by a review of uh, what we had discussed. So in, in field here, we said there are a few principles. Principle of locality in lecture three and four, we discussed it. We said there's an action principle and the fact that we can write it, we write it as an uh, integral over space time of some functional um, called Lagrangian that is a locality. We have a bunch of examples in part three and four, we're gonna go over symmetry. So uh, we're gonna be concerned with symmetry in, uh, in these two lectures, these two parts. So in part three in particular, we're gonna be talking about this triangle. So this is a connection between three different things. One is symmetries in physics. The other one is conservation laws, and then group representations. So group representations are some mathematical formalism. You could view it as the mathematical side of how we talk about symmetries in the Hilbert space, right? So that's what was all about group representations, about how we represent our physical symmetries in the Hilbert space. So in quantum mechanics, you've learned that you're gonna uh, represent all the, your states as vectors in Hilbert space. Now, how do you represent the symmetry transformations? Um, we'll give some examples in part three. Uh, very helpful, ex useful examples are gonna be Lie algebras. And then at the end of part three, we're going to talk about gauge redundancies and constraints. So um, the connection between symmetries and conservation laws is highlighted by using uh, an uh, Emmy Noether's first theorem that is going to be about today's lecture. The connection between symmetries in physics and group representation is perhaps something that should be familiar from your quantum mechanics. It's Wigner's theorem that says uh, symmetries in very colloquially said, symmetries and uh, could be represented should, could be represented in uh, the Hilbert space as the action of unitary or anti-unitary uh, transformations. All right, so today we're going to talk about this part. This is the topic of today. Let me know there's first theorem. All right. Any questions about where we're going to go today? If not, let's start. It's always helpful to just before proving things or saying something rigorous, let's just colloquially say, what do we mean? What is the content of any Noether's first theorem? So the theorem says to every differentiable symmetry transformation of a local action, there corresponds the conserved local current, right? So here, the, these words need expl explanation. And we're gonna, uh, before actually trying to prove anything or discuss any uh, this in rigorously, we're gonna go through every step of the way of what these different, what is a differentiable symmetry transformation, local action, hopefully you know what the local action is, and what is a conserved local car. All right. So let's recall what a classical field is. A classical field, in the very limited definition I gave you, uh, I've given you guys so far, is a function from space time that I usually write as curly m to say if it's a complex field, as if it's a complex scalar field, it's a function from the space time to complex numbers, right? So here's the space time manifold. Here's a point p, so it associates to every point uh, a value, right? So uh, 
more generally, you could have a collection of fields that I'm going to represent by phi with some arbitrary index phi a. We give an example of a complex scalar field, which we could represent as a two-dimensional vector field, right? Phi 1, phi 2, two-dimensional vector. So the word vector field is loaded. Now, uh, a local action means that you have an interval over space-time. There will be a sum over this index if you view these as independent fields. And there will be a Lagrangian associated with them. There could be interaction term that mixes these guys. The, there could be all sorts of connection, right, between them. All right. So as we today, one of the goals is actually one of the things that will come out slowly is this. We start we started the conversation by saying the field is a function on space time. We're gonna refine this. We're gonna this is this this picture is gonna get refined as we go along in the course. So if you knew enough differential geometry, I could just give you a very clear definition right now, but we're gonna build that. It's much better to learn mathematics through physics. Right? Otherwise, there's no point in just throwing some math at the desk. All right, so this is going to be our working example thought picture that we have in mind. A field is a function from space time to uh, complex numbers, say. All right, so now, um, Let's start by saying what is, what is a differentiable symmetry transformation, all right? So let's start with transformations. There are two types of transformations we could have. We could have internal transformations or we could have space-time transformations. So space-time transformations, they don't need any explanation. You already know examples of them, right? So there could be any function from space-time coordinates to coordinates, yeah. right? So here I'm giving you a very specific linear transformation that you're familiar with is, as an example is Poincaré transformation, right? Now, internal transformations, we also give an example in the case of this uh, complex vector field. You could have a rotation among the two elements of the internal field. So this is not a space-time transformation. It's something that occurs at every point in space-time, right? This is an internal transformation. A general transformation is a combination of both, right? So your field phi, not only your x goes to a prime, also your field phi goes to phi prime. That's a general transformation, right? There will be internal transformation, p bit, and then there will be space time transformation. Because in the term, I said the word differentiable, right? We're gonna talk about infinitesimal uh, transformation. So, an infinitesimal transformation, I'm going to write it as this delta phi is going to be this minus this infinitesimal, right? So you take, I, I'm just suppressing the index A here for now. Actually, yeah, I should probably put, put it back in. So I hear this. Um, so there, this is the part that is go, phi going to phi prime. And uh, okay, then you have x prime, you expand x prime. So I, I just threw out the, the bits that have that were second order in delta phi a. Now I throw out the bits that are second order in delta x, and this is the full transformation I have, right? So it's as you can see, the infinitesimal transformation could be split into two parts, right? This is the part that is um, internal. And this is the part that space time. Good. That's the general transformation. Um, now it's a symmetry if delta s. It's a symmetry of the action if, as if, if the action under this transformation means invariant. Right. So so far. I've told you what a, a symmetry transformation is. We're gonna discuss differentiable keyword of a local action. Now we're gonna talk about conserved local current. What is a conserved local current, right? The other side of the equal, so the, the theorem says something implies something, right? So now we're talking about the, the, the other side. So a conserved local current should be familiar from electrodynamics, but if, if you don't remember it, I'm just gonna explain it again. You have this vector, j mu, this index i is because you could have several conserved currents. 
And the, the divergence, the four dimensional divergence of this guy is zero. You should remember this from, you probably recall this from the last lecture. So J zero, the time component of the space time vector is gonna be something we call charge density. And the conservation, I'm just gonna say in a second that this conservation law, the conservation of current is gonna tell you that the charge is conserved. So how does that work? You take space time, split it, Minkowski space time, for example, and split it into time and space. So this is some time slice, TI, initial time, final time. You integrate your, the zero component of your current. This is charge density over space at any time. Charge density integrated over space is charge at that time, right? So this is what the expression is. Now, if you subtract the value of charge at t final, uh, t initial from the value of uh, charge at t final, using Stokes theorem, you could write this down as an integral over del mu of, oh, sorry, of j mu. But we just said that conserve local current means that this del mu j mu is zero. So it's a total derivative, therefore this is zero. So conserve local current implies the change in the charge is zero. You might wonder if it goes the other way around. Can anyone say, uh, how, how, if, I, if I know that charge is conserved, how can I deduce that the, there is a local current that's conserved? Any, any ideas, any thoughts? This is actually something deep. This is not just some random thing I'm throwing out. So I did this particular splitting, this particular slicing of space time. In general, I can just pick any arbitrary region of space time, right? Any region of space time. and do this, uh, calculate the charge associated with this, right? So now what I'm doing is that I'm gonna integrate J mu mu, del mu J mu over this region. So there will be a perpendicular element of it. There will be boundary term from Stokes theorem, right? Conservation of charge is now the statement that under smooth transformations of this boundary, your charge doesn't change. If you require, so that your charge is a topological object. If you change your boundary, it doesn't, as long as you don't change the topology, it doesn't change. If you require that the charge is conserved under all arbitrary smooth, uh, continuous uh, transformations of your, your region, then that will tell you that the local current has to be conserved. Any questions? If this quick this comment was quick, that's okay. It's an advanced comment. So what did we define so far? We define what a glow, what a transformation is, what we mean by transformation. There were internal piece to it, there was space-time piece to it. We'll discuss about what it means for it to be differentiable, right? And we said what is the word, what does the word symmetry mean here? Symmetry of the action, meaning that the variation of the action under the transformation is zero, right? That's what the symmetry of the action means. And then uh, we said what the conserved local current is. Questions? Uh, uh, could you uh, I go over that entire part of conserved local currents you're talking about the, like the arbitrary, uh, how do you call it, arbitrary transformations of boundaries and stuff like that? I didn't really understand what what you, what, what you meant out there. Uh, forget about this topological comment. Is this part clear? Uh, here, what I used is just Stokes theorem, right? So here, all I did was Stokes theorem. And what I showed is that if conserved, we have a conserved local current, that implies that your charge is conserved. Is that part clear? Yes, yes. Yes. All right, so if that's clear, let's not, 
I'm happy to talk to you about that comment offline. That's a little bit more advanced. All right. So you might wonder, okay, this delta S equals zero rings a bell. We did that in the principle of minimum action. If delta S was zero always, what are we talking about here, right? We're talking, now we're talking about delta S being zero, meaning symmetry, whereas in the past, what we said was that, oh, action is always minimized and minimization, extremized and extremization of action is giving you the solution for equations of motion. So what are we, well, we're gonna see this explicitly with connection, but just let me tell you in advance and prepare your mind. When we said that the action principle, we when we der, der, we did the derivation of the action principle, we said delta we set delta s equal to zero for the whole space time. Importantly, we discarded the boundary term because we said all the way out at infinity, this boundary term is unimportant. Conserved charges or symmetries have to do with the requirement that delta s is zero even in finite space time, region, finite regions of space time, even in finite regions of space, or sorry, regions of space time that don't go all the way to infinity. I shouldn't say finite, because you could have an infinite subset that doesn't cover the whole thing, right? So of course, by the equations of motion, the part of this delta s that is inside the region, the bulk part of it is gonna vanish. So charge is always gonna be a boundary term. That was the comment regarding it being topological. All right, is the distinction between symmetries and minimal action principle clear? clear? So you have a symmetry if the boundary term vanishes. All right, so now, I have to walk you guys through some math, and I, I assure you that it might seem difficult at the moment, a lot to go through, but it will save you an enormous amount of time in the future because these are issues that if you don't properly understand them the first time, it will come back and bite you. So now we're gonna go through what the differentiable, the term differentiable transformation is all about. So let me remind you, so if I don't know if you guys have taken uh, well, okay. I don't know how much you remember from relativity, but I'm gonna go through this slowly. Let me remind you that in physics, we often talk about coordinates. So we have the space-time manifold, which is, you know, like Minkowski space, for instance. But we, we put coordinates. We always, as physicists, we always talk in terms of coordinates. Now, coordinates are things that depend on my ruler and my watch, right? And your ruler and your watch might now match mine, right? So coordinate transformations might be good and nice and convenient, but we have to be careful about the, the, the fact that equations of motions of equations of motion of physics should not depend on choice of coordinates, but coordinates are arbitrary. In England, they use stone and some other silly coordinates for weight, but it shouldn't matter if you use kilogram or pounds, you should have the same physics, right? So coordinates shouldn't matter. That was an example of units. Maybe I should say length, given an example about length or uh, something else. Anyway, so what is the issue of coordinates? You have a manifold. A manifold is, is some sort of a, a space such that locally it looks like it's flat. That's what the manifold is. It's locally flat, meaning that if you have a point P, there is an invertible map from the neighborhood of P to flat space time. Right now, under this map, the point P, which is a point on the manifold and the space time, goes to x mu of P. That is a coordinate map. Right? Every time I fix a coordinate, I'm just picking a particular set, you know, like particular map here. Now, you could have more than one coordinates. I could use a set of ruler and watches, and someone else might use different types. Right, so each coordinate, choice of coordinate corresponds to a map alpha, uh, a map, right? One of these invertible maps, right? So you could have a map alpha, you could have a map alpha prime. In map alpha, in coordinate alpha, point P is represented here and P prime is represented here. And in the other coordinate, they are representing different places. 
So you can imagine that the dif difference between these choice of coordinates might already imply some sort of rotation or translation or scaling or something so, right? We want to make sure physics is independent of these arbitrary choices. So you could define a direct map from, well, okay. So a coordinate transformation is differentiable if this map is differentiable. So you take this point x mu, uh, x prime mu, oh, I think I wanted to do it this way. Is that right? Let me see. Yeah, so you, you, you take the point x prime, go back, right? X prime, no, I think that was correct. Anyway, so you just take a point, right? You go back to one set of coordinates, you come back with the other coordinates. And this map should be differentiable. That's why we define a notion, we know a notion called diffeomorphism. Diffeomorphism is a bijection from space time into itself, to manifold to itself, such that both the bijection and the inverse, it has to be invertible, are differentiable. So these are the nicest things possible. Right? These are the nicest things you could possibly talk about. These are diffeomorphisms, right? These are those smooth transformations of x going to x prime. Those smooth, so what am I defining here? I'm defining differentiable transformations in space-time in a formal language. And I'm interpreting it as an arbitrary, as a change of coordinates, right? Something that physics should not depend on. Are we good? Any questions about this? But uh, aren't, uh, isn't what you call it, a coordinate transformation, just a reparameterization of the chart, so to say, of the of the space-time points. Like, would, would, call, or does calling, wouldn't uh, calling that diffeomorphism, is that co completely correct? Because diffeomorphism, you're mapping one, the entire manifold to something else, right? Sorry, well, which part was the question? Can you ask it again? Okay, why are you calling coordinate transformation a diffeomorphism? So a diffeomorphism is a map from the manifold to itself, right? Such that the map is invertible and both the map and the, the, the inverse are differentiable. So to define what a differentiable map is on a manifold, I use the choice of coordinates. That's how I define the differentiable map because there is no meaning of, diff you know, there's no, I can't say P minus P prime, right? There's no notion of distance. On, on the map, the notion of distance and motion is on these flat spaces, coordinates, right? But the uh, diffeomorphism generally move points around the manifold, right? Whereas a coordinate, whereas a coordinate transformation just looks at the coordinate uh, representation. Okay, why, why, don't, why don't you wait for a second? I'll explain that very clearly. That is precisely why I'm going through this because the term diffeomorphism is, for physicists, is very, very confusing. I will explain that clearly. Hopefully that will resolve, uh, resolve the issue, but this is something that a lot of people are confused about. Okay. All right, so, so far, hopefully the definition is clear. It's a map from the manifold to itself, such that it has an inverse and the map and the inverse are differential. Now here comes the issue thing. This is going to be very important. There are two ways to talk about, to think about diffeomorphism. There is the active way, and there is a passive way. The simplest way, so always, when, if you want to understand that, always have this picture in mind. Always have this picture in mind, right? In the active way, we work in one set of coordinates, right? So we work in one set of coordinates and we move from point P to P prime. Right? So we pick different points of the same coordinates. This is the active way. This is precisely what you were just describing. You stick to a chart. You say, I'm using my own ruler. I live in England. I, I use feet and I don't care about other people around the world who use SI. I'm going to measure everything in feet. Right? This is then now your, your transformations are no longer, no longer coordinate transformations. Now you're describing. Uh, same coordinates, different piece, right? You're describing physics. This is to be contrasted with passive diffeomorphisms, where you keep the same point and you change the coordinates. So you look at the same P, 
in two different coordinates. We'll see that these two things are two sides of the same thing. These two are two sides of the same thing in a second, right? So let's focus on active deformorphism. This is what most physicists think. This is the way that most physicists think about stuff. You just work with a particular set of chart with a particular set of coordinates, and motion is described within that coordinate. So you you fix your set of coordinates. When you go from point P to P prime, right? P to P prime, that is under your map, coordinate map in your coordinate map is described as the particle moving from x mu of p to x mu of p prime, right? So now you have a coordinate, you have a transformation, x prime of mu is x mu plus delta x mu, right? Now, I want to remind you an important fact. We, we define fields as functions from manifold to space time, right? We often write the function in the language of coordinates, right? So we, instead of writing phi of p, we talk about phi of x of p. So there is some alpha minus one in there already. So as you go from p to p prime, phi of x prime is phi of x plus delta x. So here's a setup where I haven't changed my field. I'm just changing the point, right? An example of this is Lorentz transformation, for instance, right? These are uh, these are isometries. These are special transformations that keep uh, the metric in there. All right, is the idea of an active diffeomorphism clear? Uh, what is x prime here? Uh, Sorry, wh wh where? Uh, so so uh, when you wrote uh, x mu p to x mu p prime. Then after that, you don't x, x prime mu. So what is this x prime here exactly? This one, yes. Yeah. So what is it? What is x prime exactly? What does it represent? Well, it's presenting, it's representing x of p prime. Okay. x prime is x of p prime. Okay. Gotcha. Right. The meaning of x prime, because you only have one coordinates, right? It's just motion. Uh, well, the one that the cleanest description I have is that you have one set of coordinates, but different points. So when you write X prime, you're talking about things moving within your coordinates. Good. Now, passive diffeomorphisms are when you pick the same point, but you talk about different coordinates, right? Now, X mu of P and X prime mu of p describe the same physics, right? And physics shouldn't depend on the choice of coordinates. So for instance, if you had a scalar field, which was a map from real scalar field from your manifold to R, it shouldn't matter you use phi of xp or phi prime of xp. They should be the same, right? Because so first of all, five. So th this is your, uh, yeah. this is your physical function, right? To get the coordinate description of the function, there is a difference between the actual function and the coordinate description of it, and that is your map, your choice of coordinates, right? So if you have your field is a scalar fun field on the manifold, phi of x of p should be the same thing as phi prime of x prime of p. Right? So the total variation of the scalar field should be zero. Now recall, previously I defined phi prime of x prime of p minus phi of x of p as delta phi. Delta phi of x should be zero here. That just means that del mu of phi, del x mu should be minus del mu of phi, x mu. Right? I'm just taking this guy and expanding it, and I get this. So passive picture is where you fix your x mu's and change your fields. Active picture is where you fix your field and change the uh, coordinates. In the passive picture, oh, well, what did I do? In the passive picture, so in the active picture, motion from P to P prime was described as keeping phi fixed, X was shifted, 
in the passive picture, motion from P to P prime is described keeping X fixed, field phi is changing. And this equation tells you that these are two sides of the same thing. You could describe the same physics either actively or passively. This will uh, has caused a lot of problems and confusion for people. The distinction between passive versus active, active for physicists. Mathematicians are very used to this stuff. For physicists, we we usually skip this and get ourselves really confused. Right. So we're describing the same physics: motion from p to p prime in space time. You could view that as your field changing, or you could view that as your um, space moving for a scalar field, for a scalar field. But we also said in general, in general, a general transformation. So this, what, what I just described was a, can, a differentiable transformation in space time. What I showed is that I could trade transformation in space times by transformation, keeping space time fixed and transformation in the field, in the internal field. I could trade these two. A general transformation is a combination of both, right? You can make a space time transformation and a field transformation. Are we good? Any questions? This is a good moment to pause. I'll, I'll give a bunch of uh, examples at the end. But again, every time we find ourselves confused, come back to this picture, right? So you're describing the, the physics is about motion from P to P prime. You could describe that either using a single coordinate and the point X going to, uh, the points on the coordinates are moving, or you could describing as keeping the coordinates fixed and changing the field. But a general transformation is not just motion from P to P prime. It will involve some sort of a field transformation as well, general transformation. That has to be differentiable as well for Noether's first theory. But we're, 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 look, let's not worry about that. All right, any questions? So we said that the scalar field under a uh, space-time transformation had zero total variation. So I remind you what a, what is this? I remind you what a total variation is. It's phi prime of x prime minus phi of x, right? But that is true for the field for as a function from space to space uh, from the space-time to complex numbers. But del mu of phi of x and integral of phi of x are not like that. This is why I wanted to walk you guys through this. We colloquially talk about delta mu of phi also as a field in space time. We say, oh, it's a function on the space time. That is a little bit tricky. All right. So your action, let's walk through that step by step. Your action functional is an integral over the manifold of your Lagrangian density, right? The total, now every time I write delta, recall that it's a total variation. I'm sending, I'm changing x, x, and I'm changing, uh, changing the field. It's going to be curly L, oh, sorry, your, your total variation of the Lagrangian is going to be the curly, uh, the, the Lagrangian density of phi prime of x prime and the derivative with respect to x prime of phi prime x prime minus the original Lagrangian density. And now del S has, so now del S looks like this. But I have to also be careful because del S involves an integral as well, right? So how does an integral change by the determinant of, uh, by this Jacobian, right? So if you write down the total variation of the action functional, there will be three terms. There will be the term that is an integral over space time of the variation of your Lagrangian density and two other terms, right? These, these two terms. Now, if your, if your 
uh, transformation is infinitesimal, you could expand this determinant. This is uh, something for you to check. You could expand this determinant when the transformation is like small to identi near identity, right? And you just get del mu of delta x. This is just a one liner or just uh, maybe two, three liner. It's just something for you to re recall what, the, how does, how do you expand the determinant of, uh, of a, a, a transformation into a person. All right, putting everything together, what you find is that the vary the total variation of the action is has two parts. You can, one is due to the variation of Lagrangian density. The other one is this term that came from the Jacobian of the transformation. Now, there are two things to comment on. First, I'm doing the integral over a region of space-time, so I will keep all the boundary terms explicitly. That's point number one. Point number two is that I'm dealing with a general transformation that has space-time transformation and uh, internal transformations. All right. So let to just make this internal transformation explicit, I put an index A for my field plot. When I vary the now, this is the law of variation of functionals from two lectures ago. So I'm applying that law over and over again. So you better memorize it or have it in mind so that, because I, I, I use it all the time. There will be a term which has to do with the transformation of uh, Lagrangian density that's only due to internal transformations, right? We call that this internal transform, this delta of phi was zero right, in the case of uh, scalar field. Now there will be a term which has to do with the variation, the total variation of del mu of phi of a. It's, it's easy to convince yourself that that's not gonna vanish generally. And then there will be the term that is this term, came from the Jacobian. It's a nice repackaging. You could do a nice repackaging using this del total derivative thing that we introduced when we remember we were doing the Euler Lagrange equations, we use this. It's a nice repackaging. And then I'm expanding this delta also in terms of both the field component and the space-time component of variations, right? You do this algebra, the end result is gonna have a bulk term and a boundary term. Cause I'm gonna do, I've done integration by parts. The bulk term is literally Euler Lagrange equation. So what we did is up to here, what we did is that we went through our derivation of little Lagrange equations. We're kind of like quick. I didn't quite talk about, oh, uh, what are my transformations? Are they space? Are they time? Are they like field? I, I was just saying that oh, the, the, the action is, I didn't tell you what set of coordinates I'm using to, to, to describe, you know, when I wrote the action function, I just wrote an integral over space time in what coordinates, right? So here, Euler Lagrange equations, we, we will set the bulk term to zero and there will be a boundary term. This is the boundary term that I'm very explicit about. This is the volume element on the bound. All right, so we learned that delta of S could be written as a total boundary term like this. This expression, cap big of the notation, this funky thing has a name. It's called energy momentum tensor. This is its very definition. It has a name. It's called energy momentum tensor, stress tensor. Every time you hear it in physics, that's what it is. This is the very definition of it. I'll, I'll prove to you by the end of this lecture that it's actually conserved. It's a conserved current. It's conserve local fire. But for now, it's just local function, uh, local function. All right, so let's uh, remind ourselves what is the calculation doing? We're cal we took a region of space-time B and we calculated the total total variation of the action functional as we vary, make a general transformation of space-time 
and the field variables. We discovered that there will be two terms, there will be the bulk term that vanishes by the Euler and Lagrange equations, and then there will be the boundary term. So because we, we don't, I mean, we can't, we simply cannot force this delta s to be zero. We, if your transformation, the combined transformation of space, time, and the field variable is such that delta s is zero, we say we have a symmetry. Right? So our, initially, I just said what I defined the symmetry, but now I'm actually explaining that the more nuanced statement. So we did this all this math to, to see explicitly that under variation and general variation, there will be always only a boundary term. Now, the boundary term vanishing, if the boundary term vanishes, you have a symmetry. Right? This is what Emmy Noder did, actually. So now we call, so now let's just write down, use the following notation. Say the variation of space, we're going to infinitesimally thinking of them as a bunch of small epsilon parameters. I'm putting an index i so that because I can just uh, write, pick a set of independent variables of x mu i, and then the variation of the field this way. This is just a set of variables I'm going to use as I go through the examples. So we saw that delta s equal to 0, it's a symmetry if this integral is 0. And I've expanded everything in terms of epsilon i. This thing has a name. It's called current density. I'm lying a little bit, actually. It will, I'll, I'll clarify in a second. What I, what I lied about is that this, this thing doesn't quite have an index for density. You, this is an integral on the boundary. You write it as a total integral in space time. And then that's, well, actually, let me, let me remove this for a second. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Now, because this is a boundary term, I can write it as an integral over the whole bulk of something that's a complete derivative. Ooh, what am I doing? Right, this is what I explained earlier. This is Stokes zero. Therefore, your del mu of j mu i is going to be zero. That's your conserved car. Actually, this is the conserved car, actually. If I pick my epsilon i, well, okay. It is it, the the yeah. I I think you just have to think about what this delta u n is. It's a normal. All right. So recap. What did we do? We said this is. I mean, order said that if you have a differentiable transformation that leaves the action invariant, including the boundary term, because the variation of the action will be a bulk term that the Euler Lagrange will tell you is zero. And if the, but importantly, if the boundary term vanishes, then you have a symmetry. And that means that you have a conserved current J mu. And then I, I just I explained earlier that if you split this to space, space time into space and time, then J zero is going to be um, the charge density integral of. J, J zero of, over I is going to be the charge and the variation of charge is zero. This was very formal. I'm gonna, in the remaining time, I'm gonna give examples, all right? But let's pause here for a few seconds. So what did we do? Let me summarize. We showed Emmy Noder's first theorem 
that connects symmetry transformations, symmetries of the action, local actions, more precisely, differentiable uh, symmetry transformations of the local action to the existence of conserved local cards, conservation laws, right? The way we did it was that we wrote down the most general differentiable transformation. It involved the space component, space-time component, it involved the field component. I commented on how you could trade space-time and the field variations sometimes, right, in some pictures. So that's the active versus passive picture of the film algorithm that confuse everyone, confuses everyone. But in general, we have a general transformation. Let's not worry about that. Then we wrote down how does that general transformation act on the action. In full generality, we saw that there will be we there will be determinant term, there will be all sorts of terms. We repackaged everything in the language of a bulk term and a bounding term. The bulk term was precisely what we'd shown previously, but vanishes using the little Lagrange equation, because our equations are motion. So it's all a boundary term. Now a symmetry becomes something, a transformation of symmetry if that boundary term vanishes. And then when, when that boundary term vanishes, you do end up with a conserved part defined here. It does give you a conserved charge as well. All right. So let's go through a bunch of examples. The simplest example is space-time transformation. All right. For a bunch of scalar fields, for just a bunch of scalar fields. This is an isometry of the Minkowski space-time. That just means a Lipschitz metric invariant. So let's just write delta x mu as some epsilon i, x mu i. That just means that x mu i are just uh, identity matrix, right? Or chronic error delta, sorry, that's the term, chronic error delta. Because I take a bunch of scalar fields, delta phi of a's is zero. So all these phi a i's are zero. So what was my expression for J mu i? More conserved current, we could read that from here. This was my J mu i. This term is zero. All that's left is theta mu nu. What was the name of theta mu nu? We said it's stress tensor. So energy or energy momentum tensor. Energy momentum tensor, we conclude, is the current is the local current associated with space-time transformation, period. You have a stress energy tensor every time you have space-time transformations. Importantly, you do not need Lorentz transformations. Non-relativistic field theory also has the space-time, uh, has energy momentum tensor as a conserved current associated with time translation and space translation, as long as space translations are symmetry. So what are the car charges that are associated with this? Well, momenta. If you integrate over your conserved current is minus stress energy tensor. If you integrate over it, you're going to get momenta. So you're, you're going to get form momenta, right? Momentum back. Uh, sorry, d plus one momenta. So space momenta and time momentum, which is otherwise known as Hamilton energy, right? These are conservation laws that are perhaps familiar from non-relativists, et cetera. Any questions? Uh, shouldn't we take like zeroth component uh, in the integral for j? So yeah, very good point. Because the so the, in the principle that I said, you know, so here I could I could pick the the this surface to be the zeroth component, right? And that will give me energy, right? But alternatively, I could write down the same thing for. Um, because I have a conservation law, I can also do it this way. I could do it this way. Uh, true. I, I thought it was in the index i. Um, oh yeah, that's so, actually true. That, that's in the index i. That, that's true. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I think so. Like instead of mu, probably we have just zero component, and then then the news are. That's, right, that's right. Very good. Yes. 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 Very good. Correct. Thank you. Thanks for the correction. Uh, yeah. So here p zero is going to be. Um, Sorry, this is index, this is sigma, right? It's going to be 
j zero mu yeah uh well actually no that's not true um i think it's just zero zero right j zero yeah j zero mu. Yeah. that's right because uh i had d sigma mu here yeah this oops this is i had d sigma mu here d sigma mu when i exploited time like this this becomes integral over uh d d of x yeah this is what the expression is mm -hmm. thanks thanks that was a good point all right so the simplest example of conserved current local current of I mean, Oder's first theorem was we just as the first example simplest example we discovered energy momentum tensor as the local current associated with space time transfer translations as a symmetry. I'm gonna work out two more examples. And again, as usual, these examples have a point. The first example I worked out had only space time transformation and no internal transformation. These were space time symmetries. Right. I, the second example I'm going to work out will be a transformation that has no space time transformation, but only internal transformations. These are going to be symmetries at every single point in space time. These are called global symmetries. Okay. This is an example of what I call global, what's called global symmetry. Third example is just going to be a Lorentz transformation. Lorentz transformations will inevitably, and for non-scalar fields, will lead to a uh, transform mix of space-time and Lorentz in, uh, and uh, internal. But we'll see that in a second. All right. So let's go back to the example that we had: U1 complex scalar. The example we discussed last in the last lecture was non-relativistic. Now we're going to look at the relativistic version of it. We have a complex scalar field phi, and this is my Lagrangian density, it's massive. There is a transformation which is purely internal, and that is multiplying the field complex field phi by phase, or it's conjugate by our inverse phase. If I write the complex scalar field as the real and imaginary part of them, and organize them in terms of a two vector, this is just a rotation in this two-dimensional vector. But this is all inside, this is all internal. This has nothing to do with space-time, right? This is all internal transformation. They occur at every, so it's called a global transformation because this transformation changes, move, rotates the value of field at every single point in space-time by the same amount. That's why it's called global transformation. Right? This transformation is not space dependent at every point in space time. So your value of field is rotating. Like think of them as spins, right? For example, an example of this in discrete physics uh, lattice model would be Z2 symmetry in spin systems, right? At any, at every point, you we can flip the spin variable. That's a transformation of the field that has nothing to do with space time, right? And if it happens to be a symmetry of your Hamiltonian, it's a symmetry. These are global symmetries. There is a there is a group of such transformation because a symmet symmetries always form groups, right? That group is U one here, unitary one by one dimensional matrices, otherwise known as S O two, special orthogonal two by two matrices, right? These rotations. U one as the name of this, and this is S O two. All right, so let's chat with the concept part. Delta, we don't have any space-time transformation. All that we have is field transformation, internal transformation. Infinitesimally, delta phi is I alpha phi, and delta phi dagger is minus I alpha phi. So I just write down the expression for my conserved local current and do the uh, differentiation, and I obtain this expression. This is my conserved local card. It's a global card. 
Sorry. It's a global symmetry. It's a global symmetry. Any questions about this? These two examples. So we worked uh, two examples. One of them was purely space time. The second one was purely internal. The third example has to do with Lorentz transformations for higher spin fields or general fields, and which is a combination of space time and field transformations. But before I get there, any questions about this? Uh, this current looks like uh, the probability current density uh, in quantum okay. Mechanics, uh, uh, what's the relationship between them? Very, very good question. Um, let me not comment on that, we'll get there. So this is this is to, uh, actually, if you did this exercise, so very good, that's, that's a very, very good question. If you did this exercise, so recall the example I went through last in the last lecture, it was exactly complex scalar field, but non-relativistic. And I got the equations of motion, which look like Schrodinger equation, right? So here, this is not quite that uh, probability density thing because it's, it's covariant. There is this del mu. If you calculated this, so this is a symmetry of the non-relativistic model as well. If you did this calculation for the non-relativistic model, you will get a conserved current that looks identical to the probability current you're talking about. And that is part of the same connection I was talking about in the last lecture, the connection between um, solutions to the non-relativistic complex scalar field as classical equations of motion and shorting your equation for single particle. Right, this is another manifestation of the same. Very good observation. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, the last example that we're going to discuss today is going to be Lorentz transformations. I warn you, this is this is a little bit tricky, and you will have to work out the examples in your homework to get used to this. Um, it's, but it's important that you do it now because we're going to spend some time talking about Lorentz transformations and talking about what is a spinner, what is a vector, and the, this this exercise is at the core of that. Okay. All right, so here are the Lorentz transformations. Hopefully you recall what this means. In infinitesimal, you can expand them around the identity matrix and you'll get this double um, W uh, mu nu. So infinitesimal equations look like this. I can write this down in terms of just by change of variables as some sort of an anti-symmetric uh, tensor like this. this. This formal manipulation is actually very, very, very convenient. This notation means anti symmetrize So now, depending on the field, the Lorentz transformation will act differently. For a scalar field, phi prime scalar field was by definition a field such that phi prime of x prime was equal to phi of x, so the total variation was zero, right? That's why we could interpret it as a function from map from space time to complex numbers. But for vector fields and spinners, that interpretation is no longer true. So we're going to explain precisely what these fields are. There are fields that, as you these these objects are things that as we make a space-time transformation, Lorentz transformations, they have to internally transform in a particular way that's called a representation of the Lorentz group. So we're gonna discuss that. So to build towards this, let's pick a, an explicit example, a vector field, right? The vector field, for example, is, was the thing that came up in uh, theory of QED. So del mu of x mu, del mu prime of x prime multiplied by dx prime mu, right, infinitesimal amount, this is like a scalar. Therefore, we could confidently write 
you could use the transformation law of scalars to deduce how this guy should transform. So now it's easy. If we want to know how the vector field, QED vector uh, or alter dynamics vector field transforms under space time transformation, you just need to expand both sides. So you expand this one first in A prime and X prime, you get this, you, you write down the left side. This is the final answer. Del mu of x mu is going to transform like this. This is to be contrasted with this equation. For a scalar, del phi of x was minus del mu of phi the, the x mu. Here, you can see that the transformation is a little bit more tricky. Or if you wish, I think this, this is easier to compare. Uh, the, the better comparison would be this equation. So this term is resembles this, but there is this extra bit. In general, your let me just put indices as well. Your fields need not might, might be something like this. So if you when you write put x prime here of Lorentz transformations, right? The field will transform internally using some sort of a matrix transformation. Right? So view this as some sort of matrix index, right? There is a matrix that's multiplying the fields. Every time your field has such a property, we say it's in a it's, it's transforming in a representation of Lorentz field. It's in a representation of Lorentz field. Scalar representation is when this matrix is ident is one. We're gonna see that this is the very idea where this is the very idea where single particles emerge. In field theory, there were no, we didn't have single particles, right? It was we said it's intrinsically many body system. These, the idea of single particles are gonna emerge out of these nice representations, some nice representations. We're gonna see that in part four of the course. Of course, for an infinitesimal transformation, you can take this S uh, matrix and expand it. And there will be some sort of a J new new here. It's not to be confused with the, uh, so this is the, the, the generator of Lorentz transformation. We're not gonna discuss this much further today, but we're gonna come back and spend a good chunk of the course discussing these transform these representations because it will be important. But uh, I'll, I'll say my last point and I'll then make a few comments over there. I want to make sure that I've summarized it properly so that you guys have it in mind for part four. But let's go back to the scalar field and calculate the current density for Lorentz transformations. You just go through the calculation, you find that it's this, this was stress tensor, energy momentum tensor uh, multiplied by X mu. This is like uh, angular momentum. Kind of thing, but the generalization thereof. Now, the conservation law, this guy is conserved if and only if your stress tensor is symmetric. The anti symmetric stress tensor vanishes, part of the stress tensor vanishes. So, what did we learn? It's something that often is not properly explained in uh, physics textbooks. You have a energy momentum tensor even in non-relativistic physics. It's the conserved current associated to translations. However, because we don't have Lorentz symmetry in non-relativistic physics, the stress tensor doesn't have to be symmetric. The symmetry of a stress tensor is a must if you have relativistic symmetry, if you have Lorentz symmetry. But without Lorentz symmetry, it need not be symmetric. Now, you should keep one thing in mind. Even if you don't have Lorentz symmetry, Lorentz group had a rotation part and then the boost part. 
and run non-relativistic physics, we often have the rotation part, but not the boost. So this energy momentum stress sensor is going to be symmetric in this space components as uh, a consequence of rotation symmetry. All right, so that was the last point I wanted to make in this lecture, but let me just repeat, uh, let, me, let me just summarize it in the remaining uh, 10 minutes. I'll make a point at the very end. So what did we say? We, today we talked about symmetries, right? Part three of the course is going to be about focus on this triangle, connection between symmetries in physics, conservation laws, and group representations. Today we talked about symmetries and conservation laws, through Noether's first theorem. We hinted on group representations, not quite. We're gonna discuss that later in section four, okay? And that is going to be, the connection between symmetries in physics and group representation is something that's called Wigner's theorem. It's something that you should look up Wikipedia article for on, is something that you've seen in quantum mechanics. It's not just brand new. All right, so, Colloquially, we said that Noether's first theorem was the statement that every differentiable symmetry transformation of a local action gives you a conserved local part. Then we define uh, what a differentiable symmetry transformation is. We said there's a space-time part of it. There's the, uh, there is the field part of it, right? And uh, then we said that uh, we, we defined diffeomorphisms and we said that you could trade space-time transformations for uh, field transformation in the case of scalar fields, right? That was active versus passive. Then we took the action functional on a rebounded region of space-time. We varied this under a general transformation. There was a bulk term that vanished with Euler Lagrange equations, there was a total boundary term. We said a transformation is a symmetry if the boundary term vanishes. And the content of Noether's theorem is that the boundary term is this thing. The boundary term is this thing. This is a stress tensor that has a name, right? And uh, uh, basically, if you want the boundary term to vanish for every transformation, Here's a conserved current. Here's, a, here's something that we call current. It's the very definition of it. It has to be conserved. Conserved meaning that it has to satisfy this equation. Every time you have a symmetry, that has to happen. Then we said that you integrate over conserved, the tan component of the conserved current, you get the charge, and that charge is conserved as a consequence of the symmetry, as a consequence of the uh, local conservation law. We worked out examples. We talked about space-time translations. The conserved current associated with, with it was stress tensor, right? This, this exercise is relativistic, non-relativistic, same thing. Then we talked about transformations that were purely internal, right? Complex scale field. These have to do with global symmetries. So every time you hear the word global symmetry, I want you to instantly make this connection. There are no space time at all. This is happening all internally, right? These are what global symmetries are. And there's a conserved current that was in this particular example was this. Finally, we commented on Lorentz transformations. In the case of Lorentz transformation, if the field is scalar, it, the, the very meaning of the field being scalar mean, is that the statement is a function on the space from space time to the complex numbers. Not all fields are functions from space time to complex numbers. That was the whole point. So earlier in this course, I sort of gave you this baby version of what the field is, right? I said that was function. Those are only scalar functions, right? Those are just, and th those guys, basically they have a total derivative on their space time transformation, which is zero. Now, more general, well, we worked out another example of a vector field, and we showed that, oh, it doesn't transform in that particular way. More generally, if a field is such that under a space-time transformation, it transforms using an internal matrix, it's called, that matrix is called the representation matrix, and the field is called, is, is transforming in that representation. This is the terminology that we use, right? 
And then the last, we're going to come back to this. We're going to talk about this. This has to do with the emergence of single particles and field theory. But for now, let's, we, we, we'll, we just wanted to mention that. And then I finally, the last comment I made was that Lorentz symmetry is what tells you uh, the Poincaré, uh, sorry, Lorentz symmetry is what tells you that stress tensor has to be symmetric. All right. Are there any questions? This is the end of lecture five. Uh, so we used Stokes theorem like once or twice in this lecture. Yeah. Um, is there a way you could write out Stokes theorem in index notation? Because I haven't really seen it that way before. Yeah, so Stokes theorem in full generality is this thing. Uh, you have a function. This is a region of space P, right, del D. If you have some J mu integral, well, um, how do I write this? Uh, in this case, it would be this. It would be the integral of uh, D C mu. Let me, let me just write it uh, the way that I'm familiar with this. Uh, Function. Yeah. So this is this is Stokes theorem. This is the normal to the this is the normal to the field, so to the surface, right? So at any point, this is that D C Okay, thank you. Yeah. But if you want, I will review Stokes theorem. So I'll, I'll recall Stokes theorem um, to review it. It will be useful. It will be helpful. All right. Any other questions? Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, for now, uh, if you could go to uh, what? What is page ten of your document? Uh, page ten. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So out here, uh, when you write uh, uh, this. Uh, Delta x nu and delta phi a. Yeah. Uh, we here what you what you said is that we know that these uh, uh correspond to a symmetry, and and once the, because these correspond to a symmetry, they give the concept. Uh, Therefore, uh, this, concept. this should be zero, which means that because it should be zero for every epsilon i, it should be zero term by term. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is the case where if we have a symmetry, we get this. But how do we know that it's uh, how, how do we know that something is symmetry? How do we get to that state? Oh no 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 that 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 that's that's the whole point. So when somebody hands you a Lagrangian dense or action, right? Mm -hmm. First thing you do is you try to look for symmetries. Mm -hmm. This is the perspective of a theorist. Somebody hands you a functional uh, functional called action. And you want to understand this function, the physics that's described by this, you mm -hmm. find you look for symmetries, right? Sometimes symmetries are very clear, sometimes symmetries are obscure, and they might go unnoticed for a very, very long time. There are examples of that in physics that there were actions that we knew for a very long time, and much later we discovered that oh, there was secretly some symmetry in there that was not very manifest. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the perspective that's more like a effective field theory perspective is that you nobody hands you an action. You have a system in the lab, you design an action for it. Right? Mm -hmm. right? So in the lab, and then the question becomes like this: as you you take, you have to write down a functional that has to be local. That was principle number one. Principle number two, it you the physics description of it. You want the system to conserve energy, conserve translations, as uh, so you have momentum. Then you're restricted in the terms you put in the Lagrangian density, right? So you could use symmetry, symmetries that you expect from the system in the lab as a principle that will guide you what is the Lagrangian of the system. That's the effective field theory approach. That's a, a modeling picture. Whereas the other picture, the theorist picture, somebody hands you an action principle, some action, and then you want to understand this physics. First thing you do is that you look for symmetries. It's a big question in physics, actually, that 
some actions, I, I, I've said this, I, I said this before, sometimes the action that, as we, uh, that we write doesn't make sym some ma symmetries manifest. So it's a big deal to write it in such a way that makes the symmetries manifest. Okay. Uh, if you could go to the uh, example, the complex scalar field, uh, maybe we can like understand things a bit better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So out here, what we've done is it basically uh, transformed our like Lagrangian in, uh, our action in two ways, so to say, right? One is that you directly uh, substituted that uh, phi goes to e to the power i alpha phi and seen that Lagrangian remains invariant. Yeah. And another way is that you've gone through the entire long derivation that you just did in the lecture yeah. and seen that we get this uh, this uh, uh, this JMU as concern. Yes. Would that be a right way of thinking about it, so to say? So the the full description we'll have to go through this whole the the, the big the all this the shenanigans we did today, right? But in these simple examples, just explicitly checking that L is invariant under this is, suffices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, it uh, that you you just uh, put in these uh, things and you see that the Lagrange invariant, uh, but then how uh. How would you get the uh, conserved current? You'd have to go through the entire process, right? Exactly. But you do it once, right? You do it once, right? Uh -huh. So what, sorry, let, 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 let me let me <laughs> explain this again. If it's an internal symmetry, there is no determinant to worry about. Yeah, yeah. That whole principle collapses to just delta L and delta, capital delta L, right? This, this guy. And this capital delta L had the ha, had basically two bits, right? One had to do with the internal transformation of the field. The other one had to do with space time. There's no space time. So it's literally checking that this is a symmetry at the level of the Lagrangian density. And the derivation tells you what J is. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I kind of get it. Anyway, if you think about it, and if you could, you, you still have questions. Next lecture, we're going to continue this conversation. Any any last questions? Uh, so I know U one typically corresponds to particle number conservation. Um, is there a sort of number conservation that this current corresponds to when we integrate it? So which which current? This one? Yeah, if we integrate it, like we said, when we have the like Schrodinger version, we integrate it you would just get like one, which means there's like one particle, but like more generally in this framework, if we integrated it to find the charge, um, is there like a no, actually, particle that's number a conservation? Uh, that, that's a very good point. I haven't thought about it that way. Very likely, yeah, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, well, you, you, can, you can just integrate this explicitly and see what it is and um, I think you're right. I, I think it's particle number, but yeah. Anyway, okay. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and we will. There will be there will be homework posted uh, for Thursday. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.